Hello and welcome. <laughs> this is What the Heck is OAuth and OpenIDC? Let me get the slides going here. You might recognize this name at the bottom here, photo by Trish McGinnity. That's a good friend of mine. Uh, the first time I ever saw her, I never even saw anything but her hands. I had just returned from a trip in Ireland, and all I saw was someone switch from a martini to a Guinness, and I said, I need to talk to that girl. <laughs> Her story is way different. Um, <laughs> but even that night, we were talking about security. And she mentioned OWASP, and my heart went a flutter. I was like, I know what that is. And she was the one that got me into the whole security spectrum of things. I work for Okta now. I never expected to work for a security company. I was an independent consultant for 20 years, and I would basically get contracts with various companies. I had a stint at LinkedIn that was kind of fun. I worked for Evite for a while. I had lots of fun like developer programming gigs. Um, the only reason I'm full-time with Okta now is because, well, I worked for a company before them called StormPath, and StormPath was like, we want to hire you full-time. And I was like, meh, I really don't like full-time. And I was like, make me an offer I can't refuse. They did. So here I am, full-time employee. It's working out pretty well so far. So I get paid to travel around, do stuff like this, write blog posts. Pretty good time. Um, but I like to tell the story of my name is Matt Rabel. I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana with no electricity, no running water. I had to walk a mile and a half to the bus stop every day. And it felt like it was uphill both ways. But the cool thing is in the winter, we skied. Cross-country ski, like that was cool, right? Um, but as a typical kid, I would, in the winter, wear my tennis shoes in a foot of snow as we're walking to the bus stop. So um, I wasn't, you know, a great child. Um, but this is a cabin I was born in. On the left is the cabin, and then my dad started a sauna business, and he produced one and sold it to himself. And uh, <laughs> that's their bedroom on the right there. And that's where we had the Commodore 64. And you actually had to go in and start the stove and get it running for a while before the monitor would even function, and then you could play Donkey Kong. Um, my dad tried to teach me Pascal, and he tried to teach me a lot about CompuServe and the internet and stuff. I just wanted to play Donkey Kong. Um, but I spent a lot of time on that computer. You'll notice the best thing about this picture is the Border Collie. My laser's not working, but um, that's Sagan. That's our Border Collie, and it's the first time he's ever stood still for a picture. So I do live in Denver with Trish and our two wonderful kids, teenagers. So they're only wonderful when they're not staring at their phones. Um, I also have a middle child. His name is Hefe. I bought him off eBay in 2004. It only took 12 years to finish him. Um, he is done now, except the clutch went out last week. So it's a Volkswagen. What do you expect? Every week. <laughs> right. Well, I put a Porsche engine in him, so that's what took so long. Um, but he gets up and goes. He's fun to drive, um, but not in the winter. So I do work for Okta. How many people would consider themselves developers? OK, different audience. <laughs> Maybe I should put my suit coat back on. <laughs> so one of the questions I ask is, who likes writing authentication? Obviously, none of you do, because you don't even like writing code. Or maybe you do like writing code, you just don't consider yourself a developer. Um, so we do user management in the cloud, um, also called you know, users as a software service. The abbreviation for that is UAS. Not a very good abbreviation. There's also authentication as a software service. Doesn't get much better there. Um, so how many people have heard of OAuth or OIDC? Most of the room. OK. We already asked about developers. You probably haven't written authentication from scratch. Um, but maybe you've implemented it in your company. Has anyone like used it as a provider? So we've got a few of you. OK. Is there anyone here for a particular reason except there's beer after? <laughs> like if you came here to learn one specific thing, let me know. I used to pick on people, and it would be awkward, right? Because they'd be like, I don't know, I'm just here. So I won't pick on anyone today. No one for a specific reason? All right. So how many of you have a basic understanding of OAuth? Half the room. How many thinks, or who thinks they're an expert? OK, that's a better crowd than my last crowd. The last crowd was about the same size, and most of the hands went up. And I was like, I don't even consider myself an expert, so this is going to be interesting. They didn't call me out on anything, luckily, but um, yeah. I'm not an expert, but I do know a lot of terms and how it all works. So that's what I hope to do tonight is to show you and tell you about it so it's not confusing and it doesn't, you know, confuse you. So let's start with a bit of history. 
I don't know if you recognize this dialogue, but this is the way the web began way back in the day when we started protecting HTML pages with just basic authentication. Um, and it was awesome. The problem was is customers started saying, I really don't like that dialogue that looks different on different browsers. I want to have my login look the same on each browser. And so that led to form-based authentication. And then once you got into form-based authentication, it took it away from basic and you had to start doing things like keeping your users in databases. And then you had to start worrying about passwords and password hashing and all that kind of stuff. And then maintenance. So it became a lot of maintenance to actually you know, implement this kind of system. But the one thing I want you to notice is the authorization header there. Authorization, basic, and then a string after it, because we're going to come back to that. So to create a better system for the web, federated identity was created for single sign-on. So there's two main players in a federated identity system. There's an identity provider. That might be like a Google or Facebook or someone like Okta. And then the service provider, which is actually the application that contains the data. So here's an example just from some of our documentation how it works is for federated identity you'll be in a browser, you'll navigate to an app, you'll click on a login button, it'll respond with a client front end that maybe is in that app or somewhere else and then you request the sign in, you successfully sign in, comes back to your browser and then it redirects to there. So if you've used Facebook login, Google login, anything like that, there's lots of redirects going on in your browser that you see. So Federated Identity was made famous by SAML 2.0, an OASIS standard released in March 15, 2005. It's a large spec, but the main two components are authentication request protocol and SAML assertions. So this is what a SAML assertion looks like. Lots of XML, not a lot of information in there for all that XML, right? You can see in the blue, there's the issuer, there's you know my name there, there's some other stuff down here about it was password protected pr transport, the audience, and attribute name, but very non-developer friendly, right? Just machine to machine kind of stuff. Still very popular. It's our most popular thing at Okta. It's what most people use to add authentication to their apps. But it's basically a session cookie in the browser that gives you access to web apps. So it's limited in the kinds of devices it can work with and what you might want to do outside of a web browser. And so a lot has changed since we built apps way back in 2005. People were doing WS Star and web services and stuff like that. And now we're into, this thing isn't working. I'll quit using it. Um, it made sense, but a lot has changed since then. So there's a lot of confusion online if you look up OAuth and try to figure it out. If you use Stack Overflow, a lot of developers use that. You'll ask a question, you'll have someone that answers that question, and then you'll have a sub answer of that that says, you're wrong, check out my blog post. And then you go to the blog post and on there there's two comments that say, you're wrong, check out my blog post, right? It's an infinite mess. So what we're trying to do today is just clarify the terms and show you how everything works. And it's weird because like the HTTP spec isn't that confusing, but OAuth is a spec and it confuses a lot of people, and I think it's just because there's so many terms and there's so many different ways of doing things. So back in 2006, um, we had simple login with just basic authentication. We had forms and we had cookies. Not much more than that. A single sign-on across sites, you do SAML. That's just what you do. Uh, mobile apps didn't exist. The iPhone was released in June 29th, 2007, and you know, delegated authorization wasn't really a thing that people did. So this gave rise to the delegate authorization problem because what happened was how do you give a website access to your information without giving them your password? So back in 2006, you didn't. You gave them your password. So at the end of signing up for Yelp or signing up for LinkedIn, they would prompt you and they would say, which email service do you use? What's your email address? And then your Gmail password, right? The password used to log into your Gmail. And the idea was that they'd grab your login, they'd go and get your contacts, they'd send them an email, and they'd throw away your password. There's no guarantee that they threw away your password though, right? They could go and check for new contacts all the time. So um, it's not really a great way to be secure. So how many people have seen one of these? Right? It's login with Facebook. If you've seen something like this, you've used OAuth. This is OAuth. Delegated authorization inspired OAuth. The ability to basically say, hey, on your behalf, can I get this information? And you can think of it like hotel key cards. So if you have a hotel key card, you can go get access to your room or to the gym or to various services around the hotel. 
But to get that hotel key card, you have to go to the front desk, also known as an authorization server. You authenticate with the front desk. You give them some form of identification, and then you're good to go. You get your key card, and you can go around and you know access resources around the hotel. So I like to show some diagrams and show you how this works. So delegate authorization with OAuth 2.0. You basically say, I trust Gmail, and I kind of trust Yelp. I want Yelp to have access to my contacts, but only my contacts. So you as a user will click in Yelp on connect with Google, and you'll be greeted with a dialogue from Google that says, hey, log in to Google. And if you're already logged in, maybe you don't see that. Maybe you see this screen instead that says, hey, I'm asking for consent. Can Yelp access your public profile and contacts? And once you do that, it comes back to Yelp, and then Yelp will basically go and get your contacts from Google. So that's how the whole you know, redirection works. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this diagram throughout this talk to show you the different pieces of OAuth and how it fits in. So there's a number of different terminologies or terms in OAuth, and this is what makes it confusing. There's actors, there's clients, there's an authorization server, there's resource server, there's redirect URIs, there's access tokens, there's refresh tokens, there's all this stuff. So let's start with actors. In this system, you will have a person that's talking to a client. A client, in this sense, is an application. Right? It's the worst overloaded term in tech is client. Right? It can be someone you work for, it can be someone that hired you, all that kind of stuff. In this particular talk, it's an application. So a resource owner is you going to an application, and then authorization server is basically so the resource owner, first of all, is the, the one that owns the data in the resource server. For instance, I'm the resource owner of my Facebook profile or my Google contacts. Um, the resource server is the API which stores the data that you want to access on the very right there. And then the client is the application that wants to access your data. And the authorization server, very top, is the main engine of OAuth. So the resource owner is actually something that can change depending on which flow you're using. In this sense, it's a person. It can also be a company, it can also be an app talking to another app. And there's different things in OAuth that allow that to happen. So just to put some more concrete examples in here, this is you know, someone using a browser, authorization server is Google, resource server is like Gmail or your contacts. So clients in the sense of OAuth can be trusted, confidential, and public, which is basically non-trusted. Um, so there's a st significant distinction between the two. Um, confidential clients can be trusted to store a secret, and you can't get to that secret. So if you're running on a desktop or distributed through an app store, like, eh, people can probably get to it, right? Um, but if you're running on a server, people probably can't get to it, so you can trust that with a client secret. Um, and you know, you're running in a protected area. Um, so public clients are browsers, phones, um, IoT devices, and then Confidential clients are like an API that you host, or maybe you host in the cloud. Smart TV, eh, <laughs> right? Those can probably be hacked too, but in this sense, they're trusted, and then servers on the end there. So how it begins is you have a client, you have an app, you've built an app, you have to go and register it at the DMV. So the DMV is of OAuth is client registration. And it's basically you getting a license plate for your application. So in the previous example, when I showed that Facebook pop-up, it said, do you want to give access to Bike to Work Day? Because I was signing up for Bike to Work Day. I logged in with Facebook. And it's basically saying they registered, so it knew it was Bike to Work Day, right? That's why it was in that dialog. So when you register your client, you specify it's a web app, it's a native app, Android, it's Chrome app. They even have PlayStation 4 here. And then you give it a name. And then you give it authorized JavaScript origins, so that's where it came from, right? If you're talking with XHR or a back channel um, in the browser. And then authorized redirect URIs is where can it go back to. So you have to whitelist that information to be more secure. So an authorization server is basically the tokens are retrieved from the authorization endpoint, or what happens is you're first redirected to authorize. And then once you go to authorize, you'll get back a code. And once you get that code, use that code to go get an access token. And then once you have that access token, you can access your resources. Um, you can also introspect that access token to make sure that it's a valid JWT or string or whatever it is. And then you can also revoke it. So those are some lines to say, hey, give me a token and revoke it. 
So there's two types of tokens in OAuth. There's access tokens and refresh tokens. So access tokens are the token you give to the client to access the resource server, and they're meant to be short-lived. So minutes, maybe hours, but certainly not days or weeks. Refresh tokens are for days or weeks, and refresh tokens are just used to get a new access token. So the best thing you can do is actually have your access tokens really short because you can't revoke them. So even if you delete the person's account, if they have a valid access token, you know, as long as it hasn't expired, they could still go and do stuff. So um, it's very important that those are short. And refresh tokens can be revoked. So access tokens can be, refresh tokens can be. So they're long-lived, usually requires confidential clients with authentication, um, meaning that they actually use a back channel to get the client secret and send the client secret. Um, oh, that was important. So at the end here it says, I uh, hate these animations. OAuth doesn't define the format of the token. That's very important because a lot of people in even Okta, we use JOTs or JWTs for our tokens. That is not a standard thing that we have to do. It's just something we do because we think they're a little more secure. So access token types, the self-encoded tokens, those are JWTs. Those contain all kinds of information in them about the identity of the user. And uh, well, it doesn't contain the identity. It just says, hey, they can validate, they can access this resource, and here's the scopes that we gave them permission to do that with. The reference tokens are basically opaque tokens that are just random characters in a string. So they have absolutely no information in them, but they're still valid access tokens in OAuth nomenclature. And so I know there's a lot of words and I'm talking fast and there's a lot of stuff in here. I will make the slides available up on uh, speaker deck after and if we're lucky, we'll have a video. So let's go through the flow again with some of these terms defined. So we have a client, right? That's our app, that's yelp.com. We have the resource owner clicks on that connect with Google. You go to the authorization server with a redirect URI. So when you send to the authorization server in the beginning, you actually have a redirect URI as a parameter in that URL. And then you specify the re response type as well. It goes and gets consent from the user, back to the redirect URI with authorization code, comes back to your callback, that goes and exchanges that code for an access token to the token endpoint, and then you can talk to your resource server with that access token. Any questions so far? Okay. So the other th three terms I want to discuss is scopes, consent, and grants, because this is a real meat of OAuth. It's all about authorization. It has nothing to do with authentication. People are like, what? That was for authentication. Okay, so scopes. Scopes are additive bundles of permission asked by the client when requesting a token. So this is basically who owns the data, who gets to specify the authorization policy. So as a developer, when you define an API and when you, you know, do things that require someone to log in or someone to authorize, you define those scopes. And so you'll notice here the scopes are you know, this application will be able to read tweets from your timeline, see who to follow, follow new people, eh. update your profile and post tweets for you. At least they're telling you, right? <laughs> and then the application will not be able to access your direct messages or see your Twitter password. Like, is that even a thing that Twitter allows? Like, I wouldn't think so, but you know, this dialogue did come up. I didn't get the screenshot, someone else did. Um, but you know, it gives the user information about the scopes, to allow and to deny. You had a question? This question of the night. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, refresh and access tokens, which one is more commonly used? And what are they, in tip, what realm are they used in? So access tokens are always used because those are what say you have permission to do this. The refresh tokens are only used to get new access tokens. And so I'm going to go through those various flows that you can use depending on the device or depending on the app you're building. and. Uh, and some of them don't allow refresh tokens. Like they don't give you a refresh token, so your access token expires, well, you gotta prompt the user to you know, authorize you again or whatnot. Um, so that's a security measure because they only really give out refresh tokens to the most secure way of doing it, which is sending a back channel client ID in secret to get your tokens. Mm -hmm. Did you want a book? Yes. Which one? <laughs> API security or OAuth 2? Security. security, ready? No, I'm just kidding. I'm, you can come up and get it when you want, but we got one reserved for you now. So you have to capture this consent from the user, right? And this is probably one of the stickiest points of OAuth, and what makes it hardest 
is you have to basically trust or it's called trusting on first use and it's a very significant change in the web because people especially like our parents are used to just username and password. You prompt them for the Gmail username and password, they're like, I know that, I'll get in there, right? And they'll type it into anything. But this is a whole different thing where you're actually saying, hey, do you authorize this to actually access your account? And it's giving for one year, for 30 days, for one week, or one day. Those are options that you can put in there. You don't see this a lot, but it is part of OAuth where you can say, hey, this is only for a particular range of time. And then you'll notice the scopes over here. You know, it can do your network updates. It can send invites and messages. I would deny that one, right, if it can talk to your network. Yes? That's a, that's a good question about time. So in the access token and the refresh token, there's a duration? Mm -hmm. the well, there's an issue at and expires at. There's no real duration. OK. Whose clock is that based off the authentication server? Authorization or? server, yep. Yep, clock. yep. So if, they, if the client or the requester messes with their clock, it's still... They'll have an invalid JWT and it won't work. Okay. Uh, or the other thing that we do is we have a SKU, right? We allow a certain variance like 30 seconds or 45 seconds or even as a developer, if you're integrating one of our SDKs, you can tweak it, right? You can change the SKU to allow a little bit of drift so it doesn't have to be exact, yeah. right? But you don't want to give too much, right? Because... You know, if someone's messing with our clock, that could be insecure. So if someone gets the authentication um, cookie and token, will they automatically get those refresh ones then too? No. So, okay. No. Nope. So they have to actually authenticate, take that code, send it to the token endpoint, and then they'll get the two, right? Access and refresh. If someone steals access token, they're probably not going to steal both, right? They're just going to get one and not the other. So I owe you guys books if you want them. You want one? API or OAuth? OAuth? <laughs> okay. Well, which one? So I can reserve it. Uh, that looks good. This one? Yeah. It's thin, right? You can read it on a plane. And then down here you'll see you may revoke access at any time by going to your application in your account settings. So this typically brings up a window that looks like this. And it says, hey, you're on Facebook. These are all the things that you've logged into. So if you go in here and you revoke access or you, you know, kill it, what you're doing is you're just killing that refresh token because you can't kill access tokens. They're not stored. But you know, they might store your refresh token there so they can go and get a new access token. So now we've talked about scopes and all that. Let's look at the diagram again. We have client resource owner. Go to the authorization server, that redirect URI. The scope is what you're trying to do with that API. So you want to get profile and you want to get contacts. So that's how you communicate with the API and what you're trying to do or what you're trying to authorize the person for. And then the authorization server will request consent from the resource owner, right? That's the thing that might be confusing for our parents. And then you go back with the authorization code. Everything else is pretty much the same from there. Um, but we've talked about the clients, the token types, and the endpoints of the authorization server. And now I think it's important to talk about the two different flows. Um, the authorization and getting the tokens. And they don't have to happen on the same channel. So there's two channels. There's front channel and there's back channel. So is that the, on the, the dotted line that you showed on the previous diagram, that's the back channel? Right. Okay. Yep. So the front channel is what goes over the browser, plain and simple. Um, the browser redirects the user to authorization server, user gives consent, all happens on the browser. The back channel is a direct HTTP call from the client application to the resource server to exchange the authorization code that it gets back in the URL for the tokens, access token, refresh token. Um, these channels are used for different flows depending on what device capabilities you have. So for example, a front channel flow, the resource owner starts the flow to delegate access to the protected resource. Client sends authorization requests. This is basically the same thing that I showed with the boxes. It's just a little different way of looking at it. What I like to look at it, because I'm a developer and I like code, is to look at the HTTP requests. So you're all familiar with URLs, even though you're not developers. Um, you can be, though. Don't ever say you're not a developer, because you can be. But you make a request to Google. And so when you click on that login button, What's underneath of that login button, it might just say like slash login, but it's going to do a 302 redirect to this. 
and it's going to have those scopes in there like gmail.insert, gmail.send. Those are whatever you define in your app. And then there's going to be your redirect URI, response type, client ID, and state. State is just a random number that you made up, but you want to validate it when it comes back to make sure it's the same number. The response is going to be a 302 found, and it's going to redirect back to your callback. And it's got that code in there and that state, so you can choose to validate or not, but you probably should. And then the back channel flow, what happens is the client exchanges that authorization code grant, right, for an access token, refresh token. Client access is protected resource with the access token. So HTTP-wise, how that looks is you do a post to the token endpoint, and it will always be this content type for form URL encoded. It will have that code, that client ID, client secret, right, because it's going on the back channel, so it can do that. It has a redirect URI and the grant type of authorization code. The response is your access token. Right, it's got a token type of bearer, expires in you know, 60 seconds, um, refresh token is also in there. And then you can access those resources. So in the beginning I said, remember the authorization header? Same thing here. Instead of basic, we're using bearer. We're passing in that access token. And then we're hitting a secure you know, API and it has information in there. Yes? So uh, with the code being up there, where, where do you actually ask the user for Confirmation. So the question is when do you ask the user, where do you ask the user for confirmation? So chances are if they're already logged into the site, you might not, right? It might just say, hey, redirect back. Like you just see a flash in your browser. Um, sometimes you can actually pass a parameter that says make sure and prompt them so they click a button even if they are logged in. Sometimes you have to log in and then you have to click a button. So that's, that's still something that happens like on the authorization server or the IDP or Google or Facebook or Okta or wherever you're redirecting to. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And you had a question as well? Okay. Did you want a book? You don't have to. I mean, if you're going to burn it, then I'm not going to give it to you. You want that one? Sure. All right. There you are. So you're, you're talking about federated identity, but is this the same flow for a single sign-on as well? Yes. So it depends on the flow, and we'll get to those in a minute. But basically, if you're doing implicit flow, which is only on the browser, guess where you're storing it? Browser. On the browser, right? Um, probably in local storage. And, uh, and that works awesome until you have third-party scripts. And then third-party scripts might be able to access your local storage. And if you're a developer, you're developing an app, you never have third-party scripts until marketing gets involved. And then you got them all over the place, right? So that is not as secure as doing the authorization code flow where your tokens are stored on the server in a session or whatever, Redis or whatever you configured to store those. Does that make sense? Now, when you say, Question. When you say that marketing gets involved, is it your responsibility then to educate them as well that that's not a good idea? Or yes. Well, so the question was, the marketing gets involved, like, what do you do? How do you handle that? So I think it's one of the reasons that I kind of got into security, because the first time I went to a conference with Trish, as a developer, it was in Kansas City, and, you know, I meet a guy, and he's in security, and I'm like, hey, I'm a developer, you know, I work for companies, I do a lot of consulting and stuff. He's like, you write apps? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I can hack your shit. I'm like, what? Wait, wait, I mean, we never even said hi, right? And that's kind of the developer com or the, the security community, right? Attitude against developers is like, I can break your stuff, right? And so I've been trying to make it more of a cognizant thing in developers' minds to be aware of security, right? Because most people like are kind of aware, but developers, I think, have the ability to be hyper aware and like notify people, right? Just like we write a lot of tests for our code, we should be testing for security, we should be you know, running OWASP tests and stuff like that on our code to make sure that it doesn't have vulnerabilities. And if marketing wants to get involved, be like, first of all, the worst part about marketing and third-party scripts and stuff like that is how much it slows down your site. I don't know if you saw, but when GDPR came out, like there were some sites that had to strip a lot of the stuff off and man, the web was fast again, right? And so even our site, developer.octa.com, like if I'm on a plane on a slow connection, like it slows down because we have so many like tracking scripts in there to see how, where people came from and where they're going, right? If we took the web back to where it was and we didn't have all these tracking scripts, like it would be fast again, right? So that's part of the problem. And I think it does start with the developer to say, hey, you're really slowing down our website. You're making a bad user experience, right? This should load in three seconds on mobile. 
takes 19 seconds. Like you're kind of, you know, even though it works when you're in the office on a fast connection, people on a mobile device, it really stinks, you know? So I think it starts with the developer to kind of push back. I owe some books. Oath one? What about you? That's all we got left. So there you go. You two win. All right, so now we have a front channel and a back channel. We'll just go through this one more time. This goes on the front channel, right, to get or log in or get consent. Um, you request the consent from the resource owner, comes back on the front channel, and then it goes back channel to get the tokens, right? And so this is authorization code flow. It's a gold standard of OAuth. It's the most secure way that you can implement OAuth. But there's many different flows that you can use. So the first flow is called implicit flow. This is two-legged. Optimized for browser only clients. So if you're actually developing an app that has no back end and it's just like an Angular app or a React app or it's a single page application, it logs in, it gets an access token, it wants to talk to all kinds of other parties, right? They used to call them mashups. I don't know what they call them now, they call them spas, right? So it doesn't have a server side component. Um, you can do that with implicit flow. So most OAuth providers will allow this. And you know, it's just with the caveat that, hey, you're probably storing the token in local storage. so be aware of that, and also be aware that you don't get a refresh token. So you as a developer have to be aware that you have to wait and know that it's gonna time out, maybe prompt the user to log in again and stuff. So that can be you know, something, um, but it's also not required that you don't support a refresh token. So on Okta, for instance, we have an implicit flow that you can check the box, and then you will get a refresh token as well. And then we have SDKs for like Angular and React that'll actually refresh it for you, so they make it so it's not so bad. There's also authorization code flow, which we went through for the most part. Client credentials is a way of doing like server-to-server -server communication or maybe company-to-company, -company. and so there's no real user involved, and you'll still use access tokens, you'll use scopes a lot more, and uh, you can also do like, you know, asymmetric keys if you want, symmetric or asymmetric. There's also resource owner password. So if anyone ever talks about OAuth and bashes it, Usually they talk about this. And this gives you the ability to do the same thing that you did on Yelp. You prompt someone for their username and password, you send it directly to the uh, authorization server and you get back access tokens, right? So kind of the old way. The reason they did it is to support like desktop apps that couldn't pop a browser and do a redirect and uh, you know just legacy applications. So if you're implementing this, it's because you're in a bind and you just need to get something working and you don't have the ability to pop a browser and do the refresh thing. So even in desktop applications, even in phones, you still gotta pop a browser, right, to make all this kind of stuff happen. There's also assertion, so this is the ability to actually integrate SAML with OAuth, so you get in a SAML assertion, you convert that to access tokens, and that's a recent addition to OAuth. There's also device flow, which is not in the spec. But you might have seen this with uh, Netflix or something on your TV where you try to access Netflix and it gives you a code back and you actually have to go on a browser on your phone, type in that code, and what it's doing in the background is it's polling to see if you've actually entered that code in. Once you are, then it goes and gets access tokens and all that and it still operates like the same way. So there's six different flows. It's necessary because of all the consent from the client who's making consent and allowing server to server and allowing these different devices to work um, adds a lot of complexity, right, to OAuth. So when people ask you if you support OAuth at a company, um, you know, clarify that, hey, we have, you know, three flows that we support, not all six or whatnot. So this is a useful tool if you're actually a developer. Um, my buddy wrote it, Nate Barbatini, allows you to put in an authorization UI, redirect URI, client ID, scopes, all that and basically mimic it. So if you registered an app on Google or Facebook or Okta, you could plug in the values that they give you back and you could get an access token so you can see how it works. There's an even better one by my friend, um, Aaron Parecki, who wrote the OAuth 2 book. Um, we hired him in March. So he helped write the spec. It was a big win for us that we got him on board with us. He's a developer advocate like me. He wrote this that actually allows you to do all the different flows and it dynamically creates an app, a client, a user, all that on Okta, right? So you don't have to go and do anything. You just basically click buttons and copy and paste. So normally I go through and I show a demo of that, but since I'm the only one standing here between you and beer, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs>
So you can see this causes a lot of developer friction, right? Because one of the biggest pain points of the OAuth is having to manage the refresh tokens. You know, do you do you track that time it's going to expire and then you know send it to get a new one? Um, developers really love API keys because you get an ID and you get a secret and you store those and you don't have to worry about it. But it's terrible for security, right? With OAuth, with the ability to have rotating keys and all that that validate your jots, like it's much more secure. So what's happened is this came out in like. 2008, 2009, um, the tools and SDKs are really good now. When I first started at Okta, um, I had a really hard time because in the first couple weeks I was like, at Stormpath we had all these SDKs and I could just show people how to use them and it was great. And at Okta, like, we have no SDKs. Like, how am I going to show people how to write an app against us? But then I realized we were OAuth 2.0 and OIDC compliant. So I could use anything that supported OAuth 2.0. So I went out to Spring Security and I said, hey, you have an OAuth component, can I use it? And I wrote one of our most popular blog posts that's only like two pages long, right? To just say, hey, you can use a third party library, you don't have to use our stuff. And now we have a lot of SDKs to make it even easier for people, but like our Spring Boot Okta Starter basically makes it so instead of putting five properties in, you put two, right? And we're just a very thin wrapper over a lot of things. So. Um, that's really made it more popular and why a lot of people are using OAuth for their APIs. So there's some security issues, too many inputs that need validation, right? CSRF can be an issue, so make sure and implement CSRF um, and that state parameter to ensure flow integrity. Um, authorization codes can be leaked. Um, always whitelist those redirect URIs and ensure proper URI validations. That's why you can't use wildcards, like you can't register you know, localhost 8080 star that's not in the spec. Some IDPs allow you to do it, um, but you know, don't do it in production. Um, and then token hijacking by switching clients. So buying the same client to authorization grants and token requests, leaking client secrets and unbounded bearer tokens. So one of the biggest complaints from the security community like yourselves is that this is still like a session cookie. Right? The access token is very much like a session cookie. So there is a draft specification of a proof of possession token extension that kind of binds it more to the user that requested it. Um, it's not quite there yet, but it's being worked on. Um, enterprise use cases, you know, decouples authorization policy decisions from enforcement. Um, people really like it because you can use it to revoke a person's access to everything. Right? If they're using OAuth at the company, you can say, hey, they just got terminated. We're taking them out, right? And you revoke all their tokens. And as long as your access tokens are like a minute, then you know there's a 30 second window that they can maybe do stuff. But you know maybe wait till their access tokens expire and then go from there. And you know it's it's federation with an IDP, so it allows you to use the same users for all your apps, which is great for developers because now they don't have to write authorization. So some facts: it's not compatible with OAuth 1.0. You notice I didn't even mention it. I took those slides out because I don't even want you to know about it. Um, it's not a protocol, it's an authorization framework, and it's not an authentication framework. It's actually in the spec. So I highlighted it in red, but you can see that they were determined to show you as well, OAuth 2.0 is not an authentication protocol. Absolutely nothing is known about the user. All you know from an API perspective is they send in these scopes, and they have this access, and in the token, it just says, hey, you know, here's a unique identifier, but not much other things out there. So back in 2012, when this is all happening, we had simple login with OAuth 2.0, even though it's more authorization, right? Um, you could do sign on across sites, mobile app login, delegated authorization. Um, it was widely adopted, and it kind of became a victim of its own success. People are like, what? It's not an authentication protocol. Well, there's no standard way to get the user's information. So if you can't find out who just logged in, like, that's not authentication. Um, every implementation is a little different um, just because the spec is kind of loose and there's no common set of scopes. So when we were looking at HTTP requests, we had like gmail.insert, gmail.read, right? Those are Gmail scopes. They aren't, you know, across different applications. So what happened is Google and Facebook in like 2009, they used OAuth and they used it for authentication too. So what they did is they established a slash me endpoint. And if you hit that slash me endpoint with your authorization token or your access token, then you got user information. So the access token just proved the client was authorized and intended to be consumed by the resource server. So it didn't really tell who, when, or how, right? The person got in. So 
Back to the drawing board, OpenID Connect. So OpenID Connect is a layer on top of OAuth 2.0. And at one point when I joined Okta, we were like, hey, OIDC is what people really want to know about. They don't even care about OAuth. But because it's just a simple layer on top of it, you can't really say one without the other, right? So OAuth 2.0 is a more common term. And then OIDC is like, here's how you get user information. So OAuth 2.0 for authorization, OpenID for authentication. So it extends OAuth 2.0 with a new signed ID token. So we're going to look at the HTTP request. It's going to come back not only with an access token, but with an ID token. And it's got a standard set of scopes. So I think there's like 10 total. Here's just a few, profile, email, address, phone. It's also got built-in registration. So you can do dynamic registration of new clients without actually going and clicking through a web page. Also discovery. So you as an end user, instead of typing in the authorization endpoint, the token endpoint, you know, the introspect endpoint, the revoke endpoint, like to configure your app, you have to type in an issuer. And then add a specific URL tacked onto that issuer is all those endpoints and all the different information, all the scopes it supports and all this kind of stuff. So it makes it very easy to bring your own identity. Supports high level assurance, key SAML use cases, good old enterprise stuff. Google, Microsoft, Okta, we're all instrumental in founding it. So authorization requests looks the same except for the scope is different, right? Open ID and email. And you'll always use Open ID if you're trying to get an ID token. That's just one of the scopes you have to put in there. Then you put like profile, email, or wherever else you're trying to get. The response looks the same, right? Nothing changed there. As far as the token request, nothing changes either. You're still sending an ID and a secret, but you get back an ID token. And that ID token is a jot. It's not just a random string like you can for an access token, right? So here's another way to look at it. Um, the difference here is you'll see number one is that well-known open ID configuration URL that is standard so if you have an issue or URL whether that's Google Facebook Okta whoever um, you can type in that URL and get all the information all the scopes that API supports all the endpoints for the token validation authorization all that there's also JWKS which is the keys that are used to validate the tokens and you can rotate rotate those because they're at an endpoint right um, so that makes that a lot more secure. And then the user info endpoint, if you wanted to go get more information about the user, maybe you suspect that the ID token stale or something like that, you can go with the access token and get that. So just to look at the flow again, the only difference here is the scopes are standardized now. Everything else is the same. And you'll exchange the code for an access token and an ID token. And then you can also go to the user info endpoint and have the person's information. So you can say, hello, Matt. So does anyone know the, what is it, the nickname for JWTs? Jot, right? And so in Java land, there's this thing called GWT, Google Web Toolkit. They call that GWT. So when I first saw you know, JWT, I was like, is that JWT? No, it's Jot. So it's actually in the spec. Like in the second paragraph, they define it, you know, J-O-T. Um, it's a trustworthy standard for token authentication. It has basically a header that defines the algorithm. It's got some claims in there. And this AMR claim is actually tells you how they logged in. So it says PWD there. So you know they typed in a password. Um, if they happen to use MFA, it would say PWD and MFA. If they use Face ID, that's also in there. So there's all these biometric you know, values that can be in there as well. And then there's a little more information about the user. right? And you can populate that with all kinds of stuff. JSON Web Token IO is a site that we wrote at Stormpath that allows you to basically paste in a JOT and then it'll decode it for you so you can kind of see some information there. The grant types you might use, um, we support authorization code implicit, um, authorization code for web apps or for native apps, iOS and Android, or client credentials for server to server. So you won't see that with all IDPs, right? I don't know if Google will let you do that. Um, the difference is at Okta, like, we let you manage your users, right? At Google, you can't really manage users. You just let them log in. You can't put them in different groups and stuff. So for native apps, I like to point out some of the best practices. One is never use an embedded web view in your app um, because if it's embedded in your app, then you can access the information in there. So the best thing to do is pop a browser and you won't see anything going on from an app perspective, but when it comes back in that callback, it'll have like an access token, right? And then you can do everything from there. So
So you don't store client secrets in apps that are distributed in the App Store. Um, you can use what's called Pixie, um, RFC 7636, to protect your authorization code from interceptance. So it's a little more guarantee that it came from this device. It does a little challenge response kind of thing and adds a few more codes to it. Um, there's also this guidelines for native apps, but there's also a project called AppAuth that has SDKs for JavaScript, iOS, and Android. Use those, it'll make it much easier. You basically write like 10 lines of code and you have OAuth authentication in your apps. So you guys probably aren't as interested in this, but we have a whole bunch of demos on our GitHub repository. I think if you Google for example on there, we have over 90 samples for the different frameworks. Um, if you're into Java, there's a number of different Java libraries you can use. Um, OAuth.net has more code libraries and languages. There's also OAuth server, so if you wanted to just have a server at your company and didn't want to pay someone, um, you could use something like Keycloak or Apero or Hydra to actually you know, just manage it locally. So in JHipster, which is a project that I work on that generates a Java backend and an Angular front end, um, we use Keycloak in a Docker container because as a developer you can just run it right away. And it pre-populates it with all the client registrations and stuff like that and everything works out of the box. You can switch to Okta, but if you switch to Okta, you have to go and like register your app, right? And create a client and stuff like that. So additional resources, OAuth.net is where the spec is. And you'll notice down here, supported by Auth0 and Okta. So it's not, you know, to one or the other, but OAuth.com has our branding all over, right? First of all, because we paid Aaron in the beginning, be like, hey, can you throw a logo on there? Like, we'll funnel you some money. Now that we hired him, like, you know, he's all over making that. He's got a solve with Okta button there now, so. <laughs> so I just want to make sure you know that if you're on .NET, you know, that's vendor neutral. If you're on .com, meh, might be coming to our stuff. But the cool thing is .com is actually this book. So you don't need to pay $40 for this book if you don't want. Um, you go to .com and it's got all the chapters. You can read them through there. And uh, I guess you could print them off if you want, but it might be a weird book. So developer.octa.com slash blog, we do all kinds of tutorials on how to implement authentication in your apps. Uh, if you want to see when we publish them, we're on OctaDev on Twitter. Anyone else on Twitter? Anyone on email? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to you know, register and sign up for an account, developer.octa.com. Um, I also like to, to mention that my friend Nate Barbatini has one of the coolest videos that's similar to this. He tries to break it down in plain English and I've done my best to kind of copy his because his is so good that it's got over 83,000 views on YouTube and 227 comments that are all nice. <laughs> How often does that happen, right? So I'm hoping by recording this we have some sort of inception thing going where I'm recommending a video during a video. The other thing I want to mention is just local user groups. So the Denver Java user group um, is a really strong community, over 3,000 developers. We get about 100 that show up to each meeting. If you have developer friends and you want to send them to that, Denver Microservices, Denver Open Source, we sponsor a couple of those. So if you want to sponsor, maybe we could sponsor this one. What we do at Denver Java user group if we have beer before, during, and after. So we have sponsors for all three of them. Works out well. So if you have any more questions, you can get in touch with me on my website. It used to be like a tech blog. Now it's kind of like where Trish and I went on vacation. And every once in a while, I'll post something technical. But I do a lot of that on developer.octa.com now. I'm on Twitter. I'll post this to Speaker Deck probably tonight or tomorrow morning. All the code I write these days is on Octa Developer. There's me and the kids in Hefe. And may the auth be with you. What's that? Yeah. You're only the second one to notice that. <laughs> so I've been around the world and I've had that in there for so many times and people are like, oh, we all saw it. is that a gas station? <laughs> but I promise we weren't there buying anything. The story is that we had just picked Hefe up. It was that day, right? I'd been waiting for 10 years to pick him up. And, you know, he was low on gas. So we stopped to buy gas. I thought it was kind of funny that, you know, it was a gas station and weed store. And, uh, <laughs> and we leave here and we pull up to the next light and some guy runs up behind me to my window and he's like, man, you're leaking oil like a son of a gun, right? And I'm like, what? And so we jump out and sure enough, it's leaking oil all over, right? So we turn the engine off. Um, they're in a Volkswagen too and they help me like push it off the road. We start it up, we drive a little more. We're like, nah, it's smoking too much. There's a real problem, right? We just got it that day. So I had to speak that night. Trish was nice enough to actually 
take the bus, wait for the tow truck, take it back to the shop, and then like meet us after. She missed my whole talk. Guess what the problem was? Too much oil. That was it. Like it took him a week to be like, well, we took some oil out and it works fine now. <laughs> <laughs> but at that point, you can imagine my frustration. I was like super happy and then five minutes later, I was like saddest guy ever. So may the off be with you. Let's go have some drinks. <laughs>